Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. So good to see you all. Special welcome to our visitors. I would like just to make a couple of announcements and bring them to your attention. The first one is, by way of safety, our um, principal, Yuritsi, has asked all the parents to make sure that their children today are not playing on that blue slide in the playground at the end of the soccer field. It's broken, so please be careful. Uh, she has called some people to come and fix it, but it hasn't happened yet. So please make sure your children are not playing on that blue slide, it's dangerous. Thank you. The next one is that we were uh, gonna do some membership transfers. So the first one is the second reading of membership transfer of Michael Pantoya to San Jose Central. Last Sabbath we had the first reading and today is the second reading. And as such, we need to vote. So can I ask somebody to make a motion that we, okay, Misty is making a motion. Anybody to second it? Okay, Bob is seconding it. So all those in favor of this membership transfer, it's in your bulletins. Michael Pantoya to San Jose Central. Please raise your hands. Thank you. Any opposition? Seeing none, it's approved. Thank you very much. Second uh, announce, I mean, the next transfer is incoming. So Brother Daniel Sanchez is transferring to Campbell from San Jose Hispanic. This is the first reading, so there is no vote. We're going to vote on the second reading. So again, Brother Daniel Sanchez is transferring to Campbell as hearty welcome, but next time we'll make it uh, official. Okay, for the next announcement, I would like to invite for Indra to come forward, please. We have a good opportunity to study the Word of God every Sabbath, Amen. and we start here at 9.30. If you think that you cannot make it, no. Come, because 9.30 we're studying about the sanctuary and all the wonderful things that they are related to our life. And we are in this journey together and we want to go to heaven. Amen. Plus, if we don't study about the sanctuary, which is one of our wonderful doctrines for the Seventh-day Adventists, you're going to be lost. So please come. And Guess what? Steve has been talking about the sanctuary all over this month. So if you have some little doubt, study and come at 9.30 because your doubts are going to be bye-bye. You're going to be in shape because we have wonderful teachers here in our Sabbath school and we don't start at 11. We start at 9.30. This is the Sabbath day, so we come at 9.30. Uh, our children's divisions are well prepared with wonderful teachers. Uh, well, I have to say, including myself, no. <laughs> but we, we work for these children all over our church, and we have been studying the Word of God, and we are so very blessed to have the study of the Word of God every Sabbath here in our church. The next announcement is that we are having our prayer group time after the worship service. And I, I, I've been sharing this wonderful devotional about ye shall re receive power from Ellen G. White. Every Sabbath, I've been giving some quotes from here, and it's wonderful. And I have to say something. You know, the answers of our prayers, and Gloria is going to share with us today, because, you know, we have prayed for people to have surgery. And guess what? They turn very good, and people are, Amen. like my friend, she's already in her house. The next day from the surgery, she was already in, the, in her house. So we're praying for everybody here. So please come and join us after the worship service. Amen. Thank you, Indra. The next one is, uh, you see these beautiful flowers? 
They were donated in uh, celebration of our dear sister, Lena Latore's birthday. So when you see her, wish her happy birthday. <laughs> oh, she is right there. <laughs> happy birthday. Let's continue to worship. When I was uh, looking for the songs for today, I wanted uh, something that really reflected what we have been learning through the seminars. And I ran into these two songs blended in one single thing. And um, I think it really says uh, in music what our life as Christians should be before the Lord comes. Uh, we are going through a valley that is dark and there are many dangers along the way. But as, as long as Jesus is the leader, we have nothing to fear. And the next one is uh, that soon and very soon we are going to see the Lord. So I suggest we sing with all of our hearts, even though we don't know probably the music, uh, even though it's a very popular one. But if you cannot sing, at least say the words and you will feel that the Lord is here to lead your life. soon and very soon. Now I will ask the congregation if you can stand to sing our intro song. You can find it in your bulletin and on the screen as well.
Since we're having our intercessory and introit at the same time, I would invite the congregation, as far as possible, to please kneel for our opening prayer this morning. Father in heaven, it is indeed with joy in our hearts that we approach boldly your throne of grace this morning, thanking you for the mercies, for the blessings, for the grace and love that we have received already just today. Lord, thank you so much that we can enter into your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts this morning. For indeed, you are worthy of our praise. And Father, as we meet together here on this beautiful Sabbath morning, we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and our minds, to draw us truly into that intimate experience with yourself. Lord, we desire to meet with you today, to, to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, and to ask you for your continued blessings. Lord, I want to thank you so much for those who have joy in their hearts this morning, rejoicing over your provision, for your blessings. I, I think especially of Bob Webster, who is joyful this morning over the favorable report that he has received from the doctors. Lord, thank you for that. And for others, Lord, we want to join in and, and rejoice with those who rejoice this morning. For those who are here this morning, Father, who have doubts or sorrows, maybe there's some cloud that no one else is aware of, we pray that you would draw especially close to them. Lord, may they feel your presence this morning. May they know, based on your word, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And I pray, Father, that in their hour of trial that you will sustain them, that their faith would not fail. And Lord, this morning, we pray a special blessing on your servant, Stephen Hicks, as he again breaks open for us the words of life. Lord, bless him with an outpouring of your spirit. Give us attentive ears and attentive hearts this morning that indeed we might receive the blessing that you long to impart. Bless us, stay with us, guide us, and save us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. so glad that we can all worship together this morning. It's nice to see all your faces and I'm really looking forward to the children's choir singing today. What a blessing that is. We're having a shortened program today to give Brother Steve Hicks as much time as possible to present his message from God's throne. And now is the time when you can participate in our offering. Our offering today is for special programs in our conference, and I'd like to read something for, to you. The Psalms are full of words that describe God. David personally declares in Psalms 18, one to three, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. O God, my strength, in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, <coughs> excuse me, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Over and over, David describes who God is. In the last verse of the last Psalm, David desires that everyone that has breath praises God. That says a lot about who God was to David. As a conference, it is our desire that God be made known to all the communities that we serve. The offerings that are collected today as our worship and giving will support the local initiatives of our conference. Thank you for helping us to help others and to help them to know God more intimately. Will the deacons please stand? Lord, we desire to know you more. 
we want others to know and experience you as Lord and Savior. Bless these programs of our conference as we work together with you to make this dream a reality. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
that should work. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Two general announcements before I begin. The first is to thank you for your many prayers. If you were here last week, you may have recalled that I uh, was having difficulty speaking. So because of your prayers and by the grace of God, I have my voice back. Amen. <laughs> Um, and then the second is an advance apology for the intensity of this message. Um, we are at the end of the story of hope. So I don't know if you've been with us since the beginning or not, but starting at 7.15 tonight is the climax of the whole thing. So kind of by definition, this is a really intense part of the story. I will do my best. By the grace of God, God's name will be glorified, and we will make it through. <laughs> but... Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, Lord, we want to know not only what it is that you've put in the Bible, but why it is that you have put it in the Bible, and what it is that we are supposed to learn and incorporate into our lives as a result. And so we are asking for a blessing of wisdom from heaven, Lord. Bless us in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Okay. Huh. Excuse me. I just realized that Nobody needs to see my computer taskbar at the bottom of the screen. All right, so today is, as I said, the last step before the climax of this whole thing. This morning, we are going to learn of the final way that the devil is going to try to deceive us. Now, this is not the Battle of Armageddon. We'll look at that tonight. But this is the final way prior to the return of Christ and the close of probation and all that stuff. It's the devil's last push to make sure that we don't end up on the wrong side of uh, on the right side of history he wants us on the wrong side of history so he enlists an ally in his war against god that many people will not see coming that's why this is a plot twist it's going to catch people by surprise and it is an ally that we must know about in order to survive the crisis to come Now, I want to review the story of hope so far for those of you who have not been with us, or even if you have been, to contextualize what it is that we are uh, going to talk about and see how this plot twist fits into the whole thing and why it is ultimately the devil's grand finale to steal God's throne. So let us review. Once upon a time, there was peace throughout the universe, but that peace was broken when Lucifer the most beautiful and powerful created being in all of existence, began to covet the throne of God for himself. He desired to become God and to receive worship like God. Well, a war in heaven ensued because of this, and the devil and one-third of heaven's angels were cast out, were expelled from heaven. Um, after this, and we don't know exactly how long after this, but at some point after this, a dark little ball of water elsewhere in the universe received the attention of God. He illuminated it, 
created atmosphere around it and then land and plants and birds and fish and land creatures and finally mankind and and womankind of course <laughs> right humanity was created on this little ball of water that now had land to commemorate and remember this amazing feat of creative power god instituted the sabbath day as a weekly period of rest and remembrance happy sabbath praise the lord we get it <laughs> but lucifer renamed satan the adversary tricked the first woman into rebellion and she convinced the first man to do the same and sin came into the earth as a result immediately god promised the messiah jesus christ who would one day come to bear the sins of the world and die in everyone's place well, about 1600 a little more than 1600 years later the world had become so dark with sin and immorality and godlessness that God pronounced judgment upon it and destroyed it with a universal flood. This did not end the war, however. As the earth began to be repopulated following the flood, God raised up Abraham to set an example of faith for the future generations to come and to counter the rising influence of Nimrod, the father of paganism and ultimately human sacrifice. Right, so this war between good and evil now has two spokespeople at this point in history. Three generations later, Abraham's great-grandchildren become the nation of Israel and are quickly enslaved by Egypt. God's truth of the coming Messiah and the earth made new was restricted and darkened and nearly lost by the paganism and heathenism and general godlessness of the land of Egypt. Nimrod seemed to be triumphing over Abraham, right? Even though both of those men were dead by this point. But God delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt through the plagues and through the Passover, and Israel became free. God instructed Israel about the Sabbath and about trust in and dependence on God. Amen. That's something we should learn every Sabbath, trust in and dependence upon God and then quickly taught them of his divine law, the Ten Commandments, which was the basis of this whole controversy and war in the first place. All of this was to establish a light for the world, a beacon of hope for a lost and dying world. But even that first generation of Israelites who actually witnessed God's power with their own eyes nonetheless rebelled and desired to return to pagan Egypt. Well, God punished them with 40 years in the desert, during which time they learned obedience and humility, but most importantly, they learned about God's forgiveness and God's grace. They learned that he is a God of mercy during that time, after watching him pronounce judgment on Egypt, right? They learned of his mercy during that time. Well, God, one generation later, rebaptized them in the Jordan River during, um, after their wanderings were over, after that 40-year period was done. And he led them to great military victories over the child-sacrificing pagan nations that were in Canaan at the time. Um, once they were established in that land, Israel was to become the light for the world right to now shine forth their light to everybody else from that point israel was to let everyone know that one day the messiah would come but they failed miserably and repeatedly the nation suffered a great civil war due to king solomon's disobedience primarily through women and over time 11 of the original 12 tribes were lost or assimilated into the 12th tribe or the surrounding nations. Uh, the Israelites then became the Jews of the remaining tribe of Judah. So that's where that word comes from. Because their only job was to hold God's truth and proclaim it to the world about the coming Messiah, God took it extremely personally when they rejected their commission. 
He brought Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then finally Rome to rule over them since they had failed to rule themselves in a proper way. And it was during the reign of pagan Rome that our Jesus, the Messiah of promise, came to earth. And we know the horrible story. The man of peace, the Lamb of God, was hung from a cross like a criminal. And my goodness, is that a sanitized version of what happened. After living a life that no one could impugn except through falsehood and deceit, he willingly accepted the crown of thorns, the purple robe of mockery, the beatings, the false accusations, the scourgings, the spittings, the kicking, the whipping, the inhumane cruelty and utmost disrespect, the nails made with iron that he created with the breath of his mouth which bound him forever to a tree that he had caused to grow from its seed. The creator hung naked and mutilated by his own creation, by his own creatures. All to redeem their lives from the pit of hell, to purchase their souls from the devil who had stolen them, to satisfy the claims made against them by the law of God with his own innocent blood. And on the following Sunday morning, the world changed. That same Messiah who had been torn apart from the inside out not 48 hours earlier came forth from the tomb, having conquered the grave and put death to shame. Amen. (laughs) And the devil at this point looked back on four millennia of deception and false religion and persecution and saw that it had been for nothing. Despite the repeated abject failures of the Israelites and the Jewish nations, Messiah had come anyway and done his job. Despite his best effort to lead Messiah into sin during the worst physical and emotional torment recorded in all of history, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, remained steadfast in obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross, as it says in Philippians 2, verse 8. And upon Christ's ascension into the heavenly realm to enter into the heavenly sanctuary to continue and eventually conclude the mystery of salvation, Satan knew that he had lost. It was done. The war had been decided Judgment had been pronounced, and all that was left to do was wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. The devil was now made to wait while untold millions more humans were born and learned of God and looked forward to eternal life. He had to wait while he contemplated why these pitiful humans, a mere fraction of the stature and with barely a shadow of the intellectual capacity and moral fortitude of their first parents, who even in their perfection, Adam and Eve's perfection, were still a lower order of creation than the mighty angels, Satan had to wonder why they would enjoy heaven forever while he looked forward only to flames. And little by little, the devil seems to have adopted the mantra of, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. But how do you get a planet of people already redeemed by God's blood to lose their salvation? How do you overpower the sacrifice of the cross? How do you destroy that which destroyed death itself? This is the devil's problem now. He could not. There was no way to do it. Nothing is more powerful than the atonement of the cross. The atonement is too complete. The only way the devil could steal Christ's people away from Christ was to do so in the name of Christ. To actually replace Christ all while proclaiming his own 
name. In other words, to fool mankind into thinking that their faith is in Christ, while truly their faith is in Satan. And little by little, compromise by compromise, one pagan falsehood after another entered into the church. Always in the name of safety or political stability, and always using the name of Christ. Ancestor worship from the Old Testament times was now baptized into worship of the saints. Communicating with the dead was now baptized into praying to departed immortal souls. Pagan understandings of the underworld became church doctrine, and we're going to learn about that tomorrow night. Sun worship of, I mean, various pagan deities across cultures, such as Ra, Hepa, Sol, Shamesh, Balder, and more, right? There's a ton of them. Sun worship really just stayed the same, <laughs> as we can see in these various images. This is an image of St. Peter in the Vatican. You'll notice if you look closely at his right foot that he has no toes because so many people have kissed the foot of St. Peter over time. They have worn away the statue. Yeah, no, for real. No kidding. <laughs> and yet, if we read about this statue in the Catholic Encyclopedia, they just straight up tell us that this is just a pagan statue, probably of the god Jupiter, that was baptized into St. Peter. You'll notice he's wearing a sunburst over his head, and he has sunbursts all on the wall behind him. It's all about the sun. Or how about this? Images of Virgin Mary or even Jesus himself with the sun shining forth from behind. This statue, located inside the Vatican on the crypt of a dead pope, the woman is named Truth, and she is clutching something to her breast. What is she clutching? The truth holds the sun to her breast. Or even this, amazingly, St. Peter's Square, the largest sundial in the whole world. Sun worship just stayed the same. Worship on the day of the sun was baptized into Sunday Christian worship. S-U-N worship on Sunday became baptized into S-O-N worship on Sunday at the expense of the fourth commandment. And this really gets to the, the heart of the problem that God has with this system. I mean, sure, right? Let's be honest. It's not great to mix paganism with truth, but there's not a church on earth that has gotten it 100% right all the time. Not even this one. It's the truth, right? God forgives errors. For this reason, in order to forgive errors and imperfections, he went to the cross to extend us grace because none of us are perfect, amen? Amen. But see, it's one thing to get the wrong idea in ignorance, but it is quite another to then change the law of God and claim equality with and even superior, superiority over the Almighty God, right? Those are two different ball games, and that the latter is exactly what happened. Now, I hate having to give this disclaimer every single time, but every message has to stand alone, so let us mention that neither God, nor the Bible, nor myself are at any point condemning individual people, okay? Paul, the Apostle Paul, was not condemned for being a Roman. The Apostle Peter was not condemned for being Jewish. Nebuchadnezzar was not condemned for being Babylonian, even though all of those nations are condemned in the Bible at one time or another, okay? God pronounces judgment on the system, not the people within the system. Amen? Okay. So Scripture says specifically in Ephesians 6.12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So in other words, people are never, 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 never 
Never, ever, 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 never, ever the enemy. How often are people the enemy? Never. Amen. People are never the enemy. Satan's the enemy. And praise the Lord, the war against Satan is Jesus' war. All right, so God judges people based on the sincerity of their faith, not necessarily on the accuracy of their faith. False doctrine is dangerous for sure. It can mislead someone away from Christ, or it can even give someone the wrong understanding of God so that you don't even want to get to know him. But all by itself, false doctrine does not have the power to destroy salvation. All by itself, it cannot do that. So we must continue to discuss this religious system where all this error came into because the Bible continues to talk about it, right? But I'm not trying to give like an anti-little horn diatribe up here. That is not the point. The Bible continues to talk about it, so we have to continue to talk about it, but we're not putting any judgments on the people. Amen? Amen. Okay. So this morning, we are going to identify someone else who works in partnership with the little horn to accomplish the little horn's end. And so it was the action of attempting to take the place of God, which is exactly, of course, what Lucifer tried to do in the war before the creation of the earth. It was this action that brought judgment from God. Not the general falseness, but the antichrist spirit of taking his place. Now, we know, of course that choosing its own authority over the scriptures and trying to change God's eternal law were the really big offenders, right, of trying to take the place of God. Those are the ones that are specifically mentioned in the Bible. But that is not the only thing that happened. There were other aspects to this taking the place of God as well. Now, this sermon used to be like three or four pages longer, but praise the Lord, you're going to get hungry on me at some point. So, I made it shorter, and I, I put a lot of that information on the handouts that are available for you after this is done, okay? Um, the handouts have, uh, they kind of outline several different ways that the little horn copied and counterfeited the sanctuary system, as well as several of the ways that Revelation 17, where we meet the harlot woman, um, identifies the same power in the chapter in the end times. So that is for you when we're done. Do not leave without getting that handout. Amen? Okay. But see, chapter 17, even though we're glossing over most of it, because you'll have it in your handouts, has one thing that we cannot gloss over for today. It hints at a plot twist in the story of hope. And we find it in Revelation 17, verse 5. On the harlot's forehead was a name written, Babylon, Mystery the Great, or Mystery Babylon the Great, sorry, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. See, it identifies the apostate church as Babylon, which is not a surprise to us, but it also broadens our understanding of that term. It says, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Babylon is a family name. The mother church has daughters. And unfortunately for them, the daughters are not exempt from the mother's judgment. Now, do you remember last night? Who was here last night? Praise the Lord. That's actually a lot of you. Hey, Amen. Okay. Last night, we, we were looking at this timeline of Christian history between the first and second coming of Jesus. And uh, speaking of the church that tolerates Jezebel, right, that dark and middle ages apostate church, we read this in Revelation 2, verse 23. God said, I will kill her children with death. Have mercy. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Okay. So if the pure woman of Revelation 12 keeps the commandments of God, as we read, that defines who she is, and the harlot woman does not represent blue in her dress, blue being the color of the law, 
it follows then that what makes each of them either pure or fallen is their adherence to or deviation from the law of God. Does that make sense? Okay. So the mother church changed God's law in two ways, two profound ways. They removed the second commandment, which forbids idol worship. And if you have ever set foot inside a church that belongs to that system, you will understand why they had to get rid of that commandment. Um, they shifted all the other commandments up and then split the tenth one into two so that there's still ten, despite having deleted one. But then now the third commandment, which is our fourth commandment, they changed the day of worship. No longer Sabbath, but now the first day of the week. Okay, so the second commandment is about idols, as I mentioned. There are not many other churches in the world that follow the mother's example of prayer to idols. Some do, notably the Eastern Orthodox churches do, but this is not a common practice among Protestants. So it's certainly not a universal Christian practice. However, the fourth commandment is the Sabbath commandment. The Vatican is quite proud of having changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And how many churches in the world followed her example? Almost all of them. In fact, for a while, it was all of them. Until this truth began to reemerge in the world. And so we have the mother and her daughters. A harlot family. And so, okay, long story short, God tolerated an increasingly apostate church for 1,260 years, or three and a half prophetic years, thus allowing Antichrist to have a three and a half year ministry, as did Jesus Christ, right? And a perfect counterfeit mockery of Jesus. Then God executed his judgment on that church in 1798, and she lost her political power. During her decease, the world enjoyed a spiritual renaissance, right? Have you ever thought about that? The renaissance corresponds with the decrease of the mother church's power. The enlightenment era corresponds with her not having political power at all, right? I mean, there is a direct correlation if you understand history that way. Um, the scriptures were opened without fear of persecution or death for the first time in more than a thousand years. But as persecution ceased, the churches got lazy. The Reformation began to unravel. People forgot the horrors of the papal government and began to welcome, even encourage, the Pope back into politics. Man, humanity has a short memory, don't, don't we? Yes, we do. And so today, we stand on the brink of Antichrist's resurrection. And actually, I mean, Antichrist is already, already resurrected as a political power. That happened in 1929. So if there's anyone in here who was born before 1929, you have experienced the world without the risen Antichrist, but the rest of us have not. We're living in this time. Um, you know, we're, we're looking headfirst into the time of trouble that Jesus cautioned us so sternly about all over the Gospels. But we must beware not only of the resurrected mother. Revelation is drawing our attention now to her daughters as well. And here is the plot twist. Open your Bibles, please, if you have them, to Revelation chapter 13. Although Rome might be the same now as she was in 1798 and has been forever, because Rome never changes any more than God does, the world is not the same as it was in 1798. Attitudes are different now. The scriptures are more widely known and discussed now. Technology has shrunk the world. Rome simply cannot behave exactly as it once did. Humanity is far less superstitious today, although we are still a superstitious bunch, but not like we used to be. Rome needs some help. Rome needs to partner with her daughters in order to do the same as she once did. And Revelation 13 is where we see the partnership 
take place. The first 10 verses of the chapter describe the resurrected Antichrist power, resurrected Rome, the risen false Christ. Now, we've looked at some of this before. Verse 2 says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the language here is drawing our attention to Daniel chapter 7, where we met the little horn in the first place. This tells us specifically, this verse, that Satan is behind this power, not Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just right there. The dragon gave him his power. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So it is the little horn power, but it's not the same reign as the 1260 days. See, this is after it received the mortal wound in 1798, and then the wound heals up, and it rises from the dead. So this refers to 1929 and beyond. And by the way, do you have any idea who gave the political power back in 1929? It was Mussolini, that's right. The Italian Hitler did it. For real, that is a historical fact. The Italian Hitler did it. And we have the promise that all the world marveled and followed the beast, right? The promise that eventually the beast's power will be worldwide. Verse 4, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? When the beast rises, it will have a military aspect to it. The world then looks, this is future tense, right? I'm talking from the perspective of this prophecy. The world then looks at this church and state power and decides that it is simply too powerful to war against. It seems invincible like God himself. Verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now, okay, in case we are confused about the beast's identity, and I really hope we're not by this point, but just in case we were, we learn that it is religious in nature because it's speaking blasphemies, and that it reigned for 42 months, which is three and a half years. 1260 days. It's all the same time period. It's letting us know that this is the same power as the little horn, just risen from the dead. Now, it's interesting to me that while we are discussing the risen Antichrist, the time period we are given as a reference point is the old little horn reign that ended in 1798. And for some reason, this prophecy is drawing our attention to that 42-month reign, specifically the end of that reign when, as it says in verses 9 and 10, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So although this little horn government led many into captivity, the leader would go into captivity himself. Though he killed many with the sword and other means, my goodness, I am not going to share with you some of the other means that they used because we're in church and there are some things you don't say in church. But my goodness, <laughs> it'd make you cry. <laughs> it'd make the strongest person in here cry if you knew. Anyway, um, Although he killed many, he would nonetheless die violently himself. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. The little horn finally reaped what it sowed. It found itself on the receiving end of what it had dished out for so long. Why, though, would this prophecy of Revelation 13 foretell Antichrist's resurrection 
and then seem to back up and focus on the time around 1798, the fatal wound. Well, that's because the chapter's not over yet. <laughs> the late 1700s is the setting for the next thing that we learn. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast, a second beast, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. In the internet, lots of people get tripped up deciphering this strange and final beast. But let me show you how easy it is. Okay, it says the beast rises up from the earth. What does the earth represent? We learned this last night. Revelation 12, 16, it said the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. When the papal armies and the general persecution became too much in Europe, the church fled to the earth, the absence of water, right? Where it would be safe amid the lack of nations and relative lack of multitudes and relative lack of languages and etc. Safe from the chaos of the old world. Therefore, the earth represents the new world. All beasts represent nations, right? We've seen that as, old, as far back as the book of Daniel. And so at some point after the, after the woman flees to North America, a nation rises from that land. And it rises apparently in the neighborhood of 1798. It is on its way up while the little horn is on its way down. Can we think of a nation presumably one of great influence because it's in the Bible, established in North America in the late 1700s and founded on principles of religious freedom? Right? The United States of America. <laughs> the country that invented freedom. Amen? <laughs> the country of my birth. And let me be clear about this. No joke. I can trace my ancestry through my father's side all the way back to, no joke, the Mayflower. I'm as American as you get, short of being Native American. This is the country of my birth. This is the country of my ancestors for 400 years. The good old U.S. of A. And it begins to dawn on us, oh my goodness, the Bible has the U.S.A. in it even though it was written 2,000 years ago. Wow. Well, sure enough, the first thing that God says about the nation is positive. It says two horns like a lamb. It's lamb-like. It has the appearance of a lamb. Praise the Lord, right? It says the nation bears the image of the image of God. It looks like Jesus. But unfortunately, however, it says we also speak like a dragon. Well, how does a nation speak except by its laws? We testify as to what we hold dear by the laws that we make. Well, what are some of the laws that were passed in this nation over the centuries that might make us speak like a dragon instead of a lamb? Well, how about the delegation of non-free people as only three-fifths of a human being? That was actually written into the United States Constitution Article 1, Section 2. We had to add an amendment to the Constitution later on to counteract this. But that's built into the foundational document of our land that some people are not quite as human as other people. Jesus says in Galatians 3.28 that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, because you are all one in Christ Jesus. But the beast from the earth says, no, white is one, black is three-fifths. Looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. We also, over time, forcefully removed countless millions of Native Americans from their lands. We intentionally gave them diseases and otherwise treated them inhumanely just because they were inconvenient to us. And although we celebrate Thanksgiving every year and remember their kindness to our pilgrim forefathers, history tells us plainly that we repaid evil for good 
many, many times over. We have invented the deadliest weapons ever known to man, including the machine gun and the nuclear bomb, and we have not hesitated to use either one. And although we have done a decent job of keeping an illusion of surface religion, right, like God bless America, in God we trust, the Bible tells us plainly that God is not interested in surface religion. Hosea 6.6 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The outward form of religion has no meaning to God if it is not filled with mercy and knowledge of God. Do not miss the importance of this verse. Jesus quotes it two times in two different occasions in the same gospel. As far as I know, that's the only Old Testament scripture that he repeats more than once in the same gospel. Tell me if I'm wrong on that, Pastor, but I'm pretty sure that's the only one. So, I mean, people in this nation, we get all upset about, like, taking the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse and removing nativity scenes from public lawns and, you know, striking under God from the Pledge of Allegiance and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let me tell you, I promise God cares so much more about him being in our hearts than in the courthouse or in the Pledge of Allegiance. Amen? Yes. If the people have forgotten about God, all of the public mention of God is just a show. It's a mockery, in fact, as if God could be bribed or flattered, right? And so our beloved nation, my beloved nation, the home of my ancestors for four centuries now, the nation, the nation that I love. This nation outwardly looks like a lamb, Jesus, but it speaks openly like a dragon, Satan. It is a two-faced nation. Spiritually speaking, it is divided against itself. And Jesus says in Mark 3.24, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. We were doomed from the beginning. We never got our priorities straight. Well, anybody here in contracting? What do you do with a weak building to keep it from falling down? Yeah, you reinforce it. You build up a scaffold, right? You prop it up with something that's stronger. You attach it to something that will keep it erect while the repairs are being made. And so when the beast from the earth, our beloved nation, when it reaches the point when its self-division causes it to fall, by the way, anybody paying attention to the news lately? When its self-division causes it to fall, what will it have to do in order to survive? It will have to attach itself to something stronger. And that's what we see here. Verse 12. He, that's the beast from the earth, the U.S. of A, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And although the Bible does not say exactly what it is, there will be some event or series of events that propels the papal government back into political power while at the same time either weakening or reinforcing the existing weakness of the United States. And when this balance of power has shifted far enough, the United States will begin to act as a representative of the Pope. We will accept and exercise the little horn's authority in exchange for political and financial stability and prosperity. Now, when I first learned this several years ago, I actually scoffed at this idea. What a ridiculous idea, right? But it turns out I just didn't know enough about history and current events yet. So it turns out that every president in recent history has had a relationship with the Pope. That is quite a far cry from the 1960s. 1960s, one generation ago, when anti-Pope sentiment was so high in America that it almost cost JFK the presidency. 
as the first Catholic president, right? And now, here we go, the leaders of the nation are actually going to Rome. If you know kind of international politics, you know that when two public figures meet, where they meet is significant because the weaker goes to the more powerful. And we see this. Every president in recent history, this is just a few examples. It turns out that the principal reason that the Iron Curtain fell when it did was because President Reagan and Pope John Paul II had a then-secret but now well-documented relationship, controlling world events together from behind the scenes. The United States and Vatican City have had a strong political relationship at least for my whole lifetime. It's been a whole generation or more now that this has been going on. But how many of us really realize that? How many of us are aware of this? Without the Bible pointing you to it, you don't even realize, right? But the relationship will change and it will deepen. Revelation 13 again, verse 13. He, that's us, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, we need to remember, we need to remember that politics and religion in the sight of God are always two different things. Jesus says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render unto God what belongs to God, right? Never the twain shall meet. It is not until the relationship between the United States and Vatican City takes a decided turn to the religious that God takes issue enough to prophesy about it. Revelation here in this verse promises that their, their alliance will one day turn supernatural. This verse is a clear allusion to the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, having his showdown with the prophets of Baal, right, calling fire down from heaven in demonstration of who is the true God. And as a result, it turned, the old story of Elijah, it turned the hearts of the people back to God. So, will the United States literally call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? Don't know. Is the illusion simply to an event with the same result that will turn the people's hearts back towards not God in this case, but the false God? You know, I don't know. It could be either one of those. There's even a school of thought that says that fire from heaven must mean an airstrike of some sort, right, with, uh, with our missiles that have fire in the back of them and come down from the sky. And so, according to this train of thought, um, this is some sort of military power, some extreme military show of events. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. We're going to have to wait and see what it is. But the end result of whatever it is, is that the people of earth come to believe in the beast from the sea, the resurrected little horn, the end time Antichrist. Verse 14, and he, again that's us, deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Did you know the world is crazy for miracles? We just go absolutely out of our mind for miracles, and this will be one awesome miracle. As the laws of physics now seem to be suspended by the power of God, Everyone on earth who does not know better, who does not know from the scriptures what they need to know about the war in heaven and the fallen angel's power and everything we've been learning, everyone will be deceived. Because when you don't know that miracles can come from elsewhere besides God, then every supernatural thing in your mind comes from God. Right? And it's as simple as that the world becomes deceived. And this verse tells us that the United States acts bilaterally. <laughs> Praise the Lord, at least at some point we learn to cooperate, just not with the right people. They act bilaterally instead of unilaterally. It does not exercise its influence over the world for its own good. 
Rather, it says every victory that it achieves, every military victory it scores, everything it does is done for the benefit of the first beast. The United States speaks on behalf of the little horn. Now let us stop here for a moment. The beast from the sea, the resurrected little horn, is a counterfeit to Christ. Well, who speaks on behalf of the real Christ? John 16, verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And 24 hours from now, he's going to be dead. This is the last kind of prayer sermon that he gave before the cross. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit speaks the words of Christ to us. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative on earth. The United States will speak the words of the Vatican to us in the same manner. Do you see where I'm going with this? Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. You see, Satan desires to counterfeit God. God exists as a holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, Satan must counter with an unholy trinity. God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Satan is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. While Satan is the dragon, the little horn is the beast, and the beast's representative the false Holy Spirit would be the false prophet. So, good morning, Americans. Your nation is destined to become the third part of the unholy trinity. And if that is not a sobering thought, I don't know what is. Revelation 13, verse 15. He was granted, that's again us, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, what is this image? It's two verses in a row now. What is this image? What is an image? It's a likeness, right? You look at yourself in the mirror, you're not looking at you. You're looking at an image of you. It's a representation. It looks like the thing without actually being the thing. So let's break this down. What have we noticed over and over and over again is the biggest boasting point of the little horn? Oh, come on. Y'all must have been paying attention to me, right? It's the change of the Sabbath, right? It's Sunday worship. It was the issue of Sunday worship versus Sabbath worship that was the deciding factor in the Council of Trent back in the 1500s, that 18-year meeting where the Catholic Church figured out who they were because now they had competitors, the reformers, right? This was the deciding factor, and it was when the, the church leadership decided definitively to reject Scripture as the sole authority of faith and to place church tradition ahead of Scripture in its importance. They actually made that decision at one point. It was in the 1500s as part of the counter-reformation. So Sunday worship defines the Little Horn Church. It is the mark of their authority, as we are about to see. Um, and so Vatican City, future tense, imposes some sort of requirement of its own creation upon the world, and the United States agrees. It becomes the image of the Vatican. It, re it enforces the little horn's false worship, and it means business for real. It threatens dissenters with death. That is the end of that verse, right? You don't worship, you will be killed. And then, following this, we read about the strange and mysterious mark of the beast, verses 16 and 17. He, again that's us, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, 
that no one may buy or sell unless one, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it enforces the mark by controlling the money. No mark, no money. You want to eat? You want to buy gas? You want electricity? Here, take the mark. Now, is this a literal mark, like a tattoo? The internet certainly thinks so. But praise the Lord, we don't get Bible truth from the internet, amen? (laughs) What does the Bible say? Well, we read the same idea in the Old Testament. It's actually alluding to the Old Testament. One of three places that we see this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 8. God says, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall bind them, bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, right here on your forehead. Now, as usual, as I said, Revelation is borrowing this language. God told Israel to remember his words by placing them on their hands and forehead between their eyes. But in context, it's clear that he's being spiritual. He did not intend for them to literally bind Scripture to their hands any more than he wanted Scripture surgically implanted in their hearts. That doesn't make any sense, right? And that's actually where he says to put the Scripture in verse 7, which I didn't include. Amazingly, never underestimate the power of religion to destroy gospel truth. Over time, these folks actually did start wrapping Scripture around their arms and and their heads. So, I mean, that's what religion does. It takes gospel truth and it turns it into nothing. But anyway, so what is this mark? God gave the command in the Old Testament so that they would remember in their foreheads and do in their hands God's commands, right? Believe and action. Belief and action. In like manner, the mark of the beast is for everyone, whether they actually believe it or they simply do it, to retain control of their own finances. Does that make sense? But what is the mark? All right, it's a spiritual mark, not a literal mark. But what actually is it? Okay, many people think the mark is 666, but it's not. Everyone's like, wait, but that's exactly what I thought. (laughs) The Bible does not say that 666 is the mark of the beast. It really doesn't. Let's read again, chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. It says that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see that? The number and the name and the mark are actually three different things. They represent the same thing, but they're not the same thing as each other. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And so the issue is the mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Right? And, and 666 is the number of the beast, and the number of a man. We just got all that from those two verses. So if we, let's put it all together, right? 666 is the number of the name of the man of the beast. Right? Now we know that the beast is the little horn, the Vatican. The man of the beast would clearly be the Pope. What is the Pope's name? Don't go on one of those, every pope has a different name, counting the names thing. That's not what this is all about, okay? Did you know that the office of pope, the bishop of Rome, actually has an official name? His official title is vicar of Christ. Vicar, that's a word we don't use very often, but it means representative. The pope's title is representative of Christ or representative of the Son of God. Vicar of Christ. Now, we have seen from the Bible this morning that the Holy Spirit is the true vicar of Christ on the earth. He speaks Christ's words. He represents the Son of God. But, you know, 
These guys are not interested in truth. They just want to take the place of truth. Now, Latin is the official language of the Little Horn Church. Did you know that? It wasn't until the 1960s that Mass was spoken in any language other than Latin. My mother learned Mass in Latin. For real. She did. <laughs> the Pope who just resigned, remember him, Benedict XVI? He actually pushed for a return to the Latin. Not successfully, it seems, but that was his goal, was to actually get back to what they had lost, that official language. Well, how do you say vicar of the Son of God in Latin, the official language? Turns out it is vicarious filii dei. Taken from our Sunday visitor, this is dated 18, or excuse me, 1915, and we don't see this happen so much anymore, this Pope's mitre when you get a new Pope. I don't know exactly why they don't do this anymore, but I think it's because folks like me jumped on this and they're telling everybody about it, so now they just don't do it anymore. But for a long time, they had a hat for the new Pope when he was elected, and in it was inscribed Vicarious Filii Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. And actually... <laughs> There's actually no letter U in Latin. It's always a V. Always. U was introduced later on to help translate Latin into other languages. And so in, in English, we say vicarius filii dei, but if you were looking at it in Latin, it would look like vicarivus, <laughs> even though it's probably pronounced vicarius. But see, it's two Vs in there, vicarivus filii dei in the original Latin. Um, you, would, you see this. If you go back east, I don't think it happens so much out here, but in New York, you look at those old courthouses that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and you will see it spelled C-O-V-R-T-H-O-V-S-E, because that's just, that's what it was, right? I grew up with that. I never understood it. Now I do, but I never did as a younger person. <laughs> and so that's the name of the man of the beast, Vicarious filii dei. What then would be the number of that name? How do you number a name? Well, how about with numbers? <laughs> right? Let's not make this any more complicated than it has to be. Latin, Hebrew, and Greek are all alphanumeric languages. The letters have numerical values. So let's count, shall we? Vicarious, 112. Filii, 53. Dei, 501. Add it all together. 666. Six, six. When I first learned this, I just about hit the floor. I remember we, my wife and I were having a Bible study with one of our friends, and we didn't talk about this. In fact, my wife didn't even know this yet. We talked about something else, and that friend was mildly interested but never came back to study again. And when, when my wife learned this, she looks at me and says, why didn't you study this with her? <laughs> she would have come back after this. <laughs> this is amazing. Now, of course, spiritually speaking, 666 is just shy of 777. Amen? 3 and 7 are divine numbers. And so, therefore, three sevens would be the ultimate number of divine perfection and divine completion. Since six is the number of man created on the sixth day, 666 represents mankind's best efforts to be God. Righteousness by works, putting our own ideas and traditions and works in the place of God's truth. And really, 666 is not a New Testament invention. I should have had this on a handout. I'm sorry I didn't. I'll bring it tonight, I guess. Um, ancient pagan priests were known to wear these medallions that you're seeing here with series of numbers on them like a giant Sudoku puzzle. Uh, and the numbers 1 through 36 were arranged in a 6 by 6 cube so that every column and every row added up to 111. And thus, the sum of all of the columns, or the sum of all of the rows, was 
666. Additionally, when you add together all of the numbers 1 through 36, what do you think you get? 666. We find these medallions across pagan cultures. One of the, on one of them in there, uh, you'll actually see Latin letters on it, so that, that one must be from Rome. But we ultimately see these amulets and these practices back in ancient Babylon. Any coincidence that the number then shows up in the New Testament describing spiritual Babylon, right? It's, that makes perfect sense to me. These medallions were used religiously by the sun-worshipping priests. Used while worshipping the sun on the day of the sun. So what is the mark of the beast? It is the mark of the beast's authority, and it is somehow linked with sun worship on the sun's day. Now, why don't we go straight to the source and ask the beast itself? This is now the third sermon where I'm letting the beast do my talking for me. This, is come, this comes from a letter dated November 11, 1895, from the office of Cardinal James Gibbons, who was... At the time, Catholicism was not terribly popular in the United States, and he was kind of the representative of the Pope in the U.S., a kind of high-profile cardinal. So in a letter from his office, we see, of course the Catholic Church er, claims that the change from Saturday to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. They just straight up say it. But the next passage I'm going to read is taken from a publication called Rome's Challenge, Appendix 1. This was published in 1893, and I actually gave this away in its entirety in last night's handouts. So if you want this, it's like 14 pages long. But if you want it, make sure you get a copy of not just today's handouts, but also last night's. Okay? I, I've, I hope that we will have enough of that. Um, This really gets to the heart of why we are talking about this today, okay? It shows that the relationship between the beast and the false prophet, the Vatican and Protestant America, has existed, unwittingly at first, it seems, on the part of the Protestants, but it's existed nonetheless since the 1800s. The 1800s. It was so popular, it was originally printed in four different publications, four different articles in, in four different issues of the magazine. It was so wildly popular, before the end of the year, that magazine reprinted all four articles together and added two appendices to it. Wildly popular in 1893 when it was published. And it reads as such. I'm not going to have it up here because it's, it's long, but again, if you want... That should say yesterday's handouts, I'm sorry, but make sure you get it if you want. Little Horn's words, not mine. Hold on to your seats here. We have told the people repeatedly, and Protestants especially, and yet more especially have we told those who are advocating Sunday laws and the recognition and legal establishment of Sunday by the United States, that in the course that was being pursued, they were playing directly into the hands of Rome, and that as certainly as they succeeded, they would inevitably be called upon by Rome, and Rome in possession of power, too, to render to her an account as to why Sunday should be kept. This, we have told the people for years, would surely come. And now that it has come, It is only our duty to make it known as widely as lies in our power to do. It may be asked, why did not Rome come out as boldly as this before? Why did she wait so long? It was not in her interest to do so before. When she should move, she desired to move with power, and power as yet she did not have. But in their strenuous efforts for the national governmental recognition and establishment of Sunday, the Protestants of the United States were doing more for her than she could possibly do for herself in the way of getting governmental power into her hands. This she well knew, 
and therefore only waited. And now that the Protestants, in alliance with her, have accomplished the awful thing, she at once rises up in all her native arrogance and old-time spirit and calls upon the Protestants to answer to her for their observance of Sunday. This, too, she does because she is secure in the power which the Protestants have so blindly placed in her hands. In other words, the power which the Protestants have thus put into her hands she will now use to their destruction. 1893. 36 years before she indeed regained power of the state. Friends, Jesus Christ is coming soon. We look at Revelation 13 we look at the relationship between the two beasts and the claims that the Bible makes about the end result of that relationship, and we scoff. We think, how can this be? The world doesn't work like this. Such nonsense could never happen. And yet we see it's been happening. Since the 1800s, it's been happening. And it's only gotten more intense and more intense and more intense. So much so that this, this relationship conquered the Iron Curtain. We have a Russian company in this very church because of this, because they were liberated from communism in the early 90s. I mean, this is, they changed the world in profound ways. Protestant Sunday-keeping America has been strengthening the Vatican since before the deadly wound was even healed. And the prophecy tells us that the day will come when the United States forces the mark of the beast's authority, Sunday worship, on the people of this country, and by extension, the whole world. Does that sound ludicrous? I mean, does that, is it fantasy to think that we will agree to legalized Sunday worship? Did you know that the European Sunday Alliance is an actual thing? You go and look it up yourself. The website is europeansundayalliance.eu. This is not a Catholic organization. This is a secular organization. It exists across many countries in Europe, and they are pushing hard to enforce a legalized rest on Sunday across the whole continent. This is happening, folks. And of course it would happen there first because we acquiesce to their power, not the other way around. This is happening. In 1993, the European Union Constitution subsection, the Working Time Directive, had language inserted into it that says, and it still says this today, that every laborer in the, in the European Union must have 24 hours of rest every week, which in principle includes Sunday. So that's built into their constitution already. In late 2008, the Vatican lobbied hard to change that wording to make it no longer in principle to include Sunday, but to enforce Sunday specifically. Now they lost that lobby, but do you think they're going to quit? This is happening, folks. And as long as we keep paying attention to the latest movie or the royal baby or any of that other nonsense that fills up our heads, we're not going to pay attention to this. And it will come at us while we are unaware. Okay? I'm like begging you. The world wants to kill us. And we need to cling to Jesus to, keep, to stay safe. At the end of time, the people of earth will have a choice to make. Do we follow God? Do we encounter difficulty on earth while doing so and then inherit eternal life? Or do we follow the beast and live in ease and safety while on earth but forfeit eternal life as a result? The mark of the beast happens when Sunday worship legislation is enforced. It's passed and enforced. When laws contrary to God's laws 
are put in place and enforced with the power of the state. And then when it is clear to the world that the resurrected little horn is no different or better or more faithful to God than it was in its previous incarnations, Jesus will come when the world decides for itself that the beast has no merit. Jesus will come. The controversy will be ended. God will have demonstrated that no amount of patience, no amount of forgiveness, no amount of tolerance towards sin will ever, ever, ever counteract the ultimate end result of sin, which is death. The little horn made its own laws and enforced them under penalty of death in the past. The resurrected little horn will do the same with some help from the most powerful nation that the world has ever known, the United States. As we leave here this morning, let us hold our heads high in the knowledge that the story of hope is almost over. These rising tides of lawlessness and apostasy are simply evidence that the war is almost over. And we are on a fast track to the land with no death. Amen? We should not lose hope or give up as we see the world slowly and then not so slowly lose sight of God and behold the beast in the place of God. It is written. It must happen that way. So we should not be discouraged when we see it happening. We should not lose hope or give up, our, uh, give up as our earthly comforts are stripped from us, as we are mocked and ridiculed for upholding God's law, as was Jesus for doing the same thing. We should, and this is important, we should continue to obey the laws of the land, for this is biblical. You find it in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. It's abundantly clear. We need to obey the law. We are only permitted by God to disregard our nation's laws when they contradict God's laws. And at least as of yet, that has not happened. So we must be law-abiding citizens. Amen? But it will happen. The Bible promises that day will come. So let us leave this place with our heads held high in the knowledge that our redemption draweth nigh. Amen? That Jesus the Christ will soon appear in the clouds of heaven to take us home to the land with no death. But let us also never lose sight of the danger that lies ahead. The danger all around us in the form of unbiblical principles being legislated in our own government. It is all leading to something big, something not from God. And, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this because this is not a time for politics, but every time there's an election, there's some new way of trying to insert Christianity into the government. And by and large, the Christians of this country jump all over that because they seem to think, well, if we just put Christianity back in the government, everything will be fine. Remember what you're hearing today. Vote accordingly. You don't want to accidentally empower the beast. Amen? Okay. I, today, I want to appeal to everyone here to accept Jesus Christ as his or her own personal Savior. If you have done so already, I appeal to you today to strengthen and renew that relationship as I appealed to you the same last night and to renew it like never before. I don't want to see this continual ups and downs, peaks and valleys, Christianity. I want to see us go up and never down. Amen? Pew warming and playing church will not prepare you for the day of wrath that is to come. Church membership will buy you nothing in that day. You must be personally ready, and only a living and active relationship with Jesus Christ will carry you safely through the greatest apostasy that the world has ever known. If you have accepted Jesus, today is the day to accept him again. And if you have never accepted Jesus, then today is the day to do it finally. Today is the day. There is no more time to delay. None of us are promised tomorrow. Any one of us could meet the end of our lives before this very evening, but even if that's not true, folks, time is drawing short. Salvation and eternal life are not jokes, and this is no joking matter. We are done with the entire story of hope 
except for the climax and resolution, which begins at 7.15 tonight. In other words, every single Bible prophet and author looked in faith to the time in which we are living today and had hope. They desired to be in our place. What a privilege and blessing we have to be alive right now and to see these things come to pass. But it means that we have a responsibility also. And if you are willing to accept that responsibility, by this I mean to behold Jesus and never let him go and to do more with your Christianity than warm a pew and fill a seat and be a member on a book, but to actually spread this word, internalize it, reach someone else for Jesus, increase the kingdom of heaven by at least one. If you are willing to do that, I want to pray with you. I want you to come down and join me. I really hope there's going to be someone in this room today who is willing to do that. Come forward with me and let not only Jesus see, but let everybody else see too that we are done playing church. God has called us to a mission, and we have to live up to that mission. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. I'm going to come down and join you and pray with you. I'll wait for us all to come up. I don't want to start praying without everybody. Praise the Lord. This to me, look how many different kinds of people we have here. I love this church, don't you? This is like, this is what heaven's going to look like. <laughs> Lots of different kinds of people taking stands for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads with me while we pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for caring enough about us to reach down from heaven 2,000 years ago and write down for us what we need to know today. And thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit so we can rightly discern your word and learn with confidence the things that are within I pray a blessing upon everybody in this church, but most especially those who have come forward and those who maybe have been physically unable to come forward but are up here with us in their hearts. I include them in this as well. Lord, we cannot do the work that you have called us to do by ourselves. We can only do it with your power and with your grace. And so I beg you, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you impart your Holy Spirit to us today and every day. Show us what to do, who to talk to. Give us the words to speak so that when that day comes, Lord, we might not be caught unawares. We might be confident in our relationship with you and the world might behold us and realize that there's something better. Lord, this is my prayer in the name of Jesus. I pray that we all might be found worthy in that great day. I pray that every one of us might hear those words that we long to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. This is the prayer that I pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. I hope you have a blessed rest of the Sabbath day. Come on back tonight at 7.15.